Hello, my friends. Welcome to La Storia del Bere on Master Your Glass. My name is Livio, and uh, if we're meeting for the first time, this is a show called Master Your Glass. And on it, we talk about drinks, traditions, hospitality, all those beautiful cultures that surround uh, just drinking socially, and even at home with just some friends. Uh, this is a new series, uh, La Storia del Bere, where instead of filming at a bar and or at the bar making drinks, I film right here in the library and we talk about stories of deep uh, traditions and cultures that the drink world has left behind to us. Today's story is about futurism and uh, a incredible artistic movement that um, really affected how we still drink today, but definitely affected how people were drinking in the early 1900s. Before we get today's video started, I just wanted to talk to you about the sponsor for today's video, and that is the Eurobar Station. The Eurobar Station is an NSF approved bar station that I designed, uh, well, during the pandemic lockdown. And it is unparalleled in terms of its looks. Um, the really cool thing about the Eurobar is that it is inspired by European bar stations, which give the bartender more space. Uh, it also improves their posture. Uh, how does the Eurobar do that? Well, uh, because it basically takes the ice bin puts it to the right hand of the bartender and gives the bartender a nice center, just like one I have right here, that will allow them to make drinks interact with their guests. And it really does, with the beautiful aesthetics that it has, uh, elevate the surroundings of the bar or the restaurant that is, it is installed in, as well as elevate the guest experience. So, experience the transformation today. You can do so, at least starting, uh, by visiting eurobarstation.com. Now, let me tell you what was going on in Italy in the early 1900s. Italy had become a unified state in the 1860s, so there was still a lot of grasping on to the very rich and old traditions that the country had. We're talking about at least a thousand years of Italy being the epicenter of Western Europe's art and culture. Uh, so because of this deep a state of traditions, many people started feeling like Italy was not really um, evolving too much. It was still holding on to its old stapled traditions. Uh, as a response to this type of philosophy, on one random day of February 2nd, 1909, a manifesto was published, of all places in France, on a publication called Le Figaro, and that uh, manifesto was called Futurism. Now we're gonna dive a little bit into what Futurism was, uh, but the manifesto, uh, which, let me take one step back. What exactly is a manifesto? A manifesto is a, um, it's a document that is produced to publish a thought process. It is something that you put out there where you discuss current happenings, um, your thoughts on the current happenings, and perhaps what are your ways to fix or address current happenings. And man oh man, the manifesto of futurism was something incredible. It came out punching, it was very controversial, it, was, it had very extremist language, and it had a mission to change everything. And by that, I mean everything. At the heart of futurism was a complete rejection for the past and a complete remake of the entire state of Italy. Uh, this meant eliminating churches, eliminating libraries, eliminating uh, museums, anything that brought us to hold on to the past and not evolve into what could be a better way of living. This was really what was at the heart of futurism. It changed poetry, it changed drinks and food, obviously, it changed uh, sculptures, it changed art. Now, some of the um, ways that the futurists showcased their art was 
through dynamicism. And what dynamicism was, was things needed to be in motion. Um, I'll get a little bit into the artsy terms here for a second, but they were inspired a lot by cubism, which was uh, something obviously that had was created in France. What was cubism? Cubism was seeing a picture, but not just from a usual window, which was basically all the art before cubism. Uh, in cubism, you saw things in different ways. So while you were looking at my eyes, you could be looking at my ears or you could be looking at uh, the back of my neck. Um, and so cubism uh, was artwork that basically entangled different views of the same thing that you wouldn't traditionally see. It was a breakaway from traditionalism. But in the futurism uh, interpretation of it, uh, there was always movement. And so you can see that in every piece of art of futurism, there's movement. So you can see there's a horse, the horse is moving. They loved everything that meant we're moving on, trains. And in that art, trains were in movement, planes. In that art, planes were flying and they were flying fast. And you can just see how the art, how the uh, movement went through uh, by how they really created their art. Uh, one of the other uh, kind of art movements that they, um, that they uh, were inspired to were other paintings that showed bright lights. And so the very bright yellow color meant that things were illuminated. They weren't dark and sad uh, as manifested in the art before that. So futurism was uh, definitely a very pleasant and dynamic step forward in uh, the movement of art. And they also put their hands on food and beverage. And the way they did it is they published a book. Filippo Tommaso Martinetti was the original founder of the futurism movement. And he was the one that had written the original manifesto. He also wrote a book in 1932 called La Cucina Futurista. And in it, he doesn't just talk about food, but he talks about drinks. Now the approach to food was incredible. By the way, the terminology was a complete rejection. Again, it was in created to um, really uh, have an explosion of reactions, of getting people upset. It was a movement that wanted to create ruckus. And so there was a complete uh, uh, obsession for eliminating any word that was not Italian. A sandwich, which was a term that already existed at the time, but it was not Italian. So the futurists replaced it with the word traidue. What does traidue mean? In between the two, right? Isn't a sandwich in between two things? Everything the futurists did had a logical name to it, which sounds incredible because all the other things that they did wasn't very logical, but cocktails or mixed drinks, that was too, that was also not Italian. They invented a word called polibibita. What does polibibita mean? More than one drink. Um, a dessert wasn't called dessert. That was uh, French, English. Uh, who knows what the etymology of that word was? If you know, go ahead and drop a comment below but they created a term called per alzarsi, to get up, because when do you get up? Right after dessert. One of the important factors of the food movement of the futurists was the entire sensorial experience, which by the way, is something that is really cool today. You see, before that time, eating or drinking was obviously super important especially in a country like Italy, where, well, food and drinks are super important. But the rest of your senses, the tactile sense, the visual sense, were usually not involved. It did not matter what things looked like, it did not matter what things felt like, uh, or even what you were listening to at times, but what mattered was what you tasted. The futurists had a way different idea for that. Uh, some of the other terms, by the way, that they changed were the names of everything you saw at a bar. And again, with a very 
logical um, uh, thought process. The shaker was not to be called a shaker, it was to be called agitatore, agitator. Uh, the bartender was meant to be called mescitore, or the person that mixes. Uh, brandy, right, which came from the Dutch brandewein, uh, was meant to be arzente, and every term was meant to be Italian, right? Arzente means uh, on fire, so literally like the Dutch brandewein, which meant burnt wine. Um, the futurists had a uh, high uh, passion to make sure that every ingredient or as much as possible was Italian. And so they started implementing only Italian uh, ingredients in their food and in their drinks unless the ingredient came from a colony of Italy. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, uh, a little later. Some of the things they would do, for instance, was they would include a solid in a drink, something that was really not seen before. In other words, they would take a drink and perhaps they would put a hard boiled egg in it, or they would throw a um, sardine in it, or they would put a hard boiled egg uh, along with a piece of chocolate and perhaps even a piece of cheese all in the same drink. These garnishes and this combination was exactly uh, getting the result that they wanted. It was a reaction. They also really changed the aspect of hospitality. Uh, some of the ways the food was delivered, the food was created, and the food was consumed is something super excited about. So let's go ahead and talk about it. Uh, in Martinetti's book, uh, he launches this thing called the tactile dinner. Now, what was the tactile dinner? Well, it was a wackadoo uh, situation here. So guests were invited to dinner and upon their arrival, they were given a set of pajamas. They all had to wear pajamas. Now, these pajamas had all sorts of things on them, such as sponges and sandpaper, things that you can touch and that would give uh, a sensorial uh, uh, effect or a, a, some sort of a sensory uh, pleasure to your fingers. But they did more than that. Um, when, you would, uh, when you would arrive, basically you would be given these pajamas, you would have to put them on. They would then bring you into a dark, empty room. And in this dark, empty room, you would be split and you would be coupled with somebody you didn't know. And obviously it was to the surprise when, uh, when you would finally find out who you were going to be uh, spending the evening with eating. The first course was called the polyrhythmic salad. Now, what did you do? You were given a salad, no dressing on it, and no silverware. Uh, it was served to you inside of sort of a, a box, and this box had a crank on it. You were to put your head down, turn the crank, and eat your food. But as you were turning the crank, the box was making a very metallic and obsessively obnoxious noise. By the way, also a uh, change that Futurism made to music. It was meant to be loud and cranky. So back to the meal, as the guests were cranking the box, hearing the music and eating this hunk of lettuce without any silverware, uh, the wait staff was actually dancing to the music. Now moving on to the second course, it was called the magic food or the magical food. Uh, in this um, interesting uh, meal or in this interesting serving, they were basically given a bowl. The bowl was, uh, had applied to it all sorts of, again, tactile things that would stimulate the touching and giving you some sort of a sensation. And inside the bowl, there was a ball made of caramel. Inside the ball made of caramel, you can't wait to tell you, there was things like random pieces of raw meat, cheese, chocolate, uh, bananas. And the magic part of it was that the people that were eating never knew what their next bite was going to uh, encounter, which was incredible. 
The third course was called the Tactile Vegetable Garden. And it too, my friends, is a doozy. I don't know how people actually didn't suffocate in this course. Um, during this course, the guest was given raw and cooked vegetables that they were not allowed to eat with any silverware nor their hands. They basically needed to dunk their head in and just start chomping away at these ingredients. However, if they ever put their head up, even to just take a break or a breath, uh, the staff would spray in their face a cologne or a perfume. Um, thus, again, giving them more sensory pleasures than just eating a meal. Now, let's just get right back to drinks because I think we're getting a little carried away here with this amazing meal that the futurists were doing. I must, um, I guess, uh, explain here that none of the futurists were either chefs nor bartenders. They were improvising, but they were, of course, um, putting in their very uh, revolutionary reactions into the food and the drinks. Uh, futurist artists were often involved with a lot of the brand marketing for liquor brands in Italy. And so you'll see that there are a lot of artworks and posters uh, that have either a futurist inspired uh, painting or drawing or colors to it, or was actually put together by a futurist. Uh, as a matter of fact, Fortunato de Pero, which was a, uh, one of the top five of the futurists, actually designed the beautiful Campari soda bottle, which is iconic in its own right. Uh, one of the other cool things that the um, futurist artists did was they classified cocktails in six different categories. Now, classifying cocktails is a thing. Uh, we do it all the time. I myself have the 12 cocktails book that basically puts all cocktails in the 12. Well, it looks like these artists had a did a better job than me because they were able to put them into six different uh, categories. Each one of them was based on what was the action that those drinks would stimulate. Category number one, per mangiare, to eat, right? It was an aperitivo. But at that time, it was called a neo aperitivo, right? Um, the second one was guerra in letto. I'm gonna be a warrior in bed. So this one here had some aphrodisiac uh, elements to it that would basically make uh, the person really want to or invigorated in order to do what they need to do in bed. Another drink category was called pace in letto, peace in bed. Time to go to sleep, right? So ingredients that would basically aid let's call it maybe chamomile or any of those ingredients that would aid you in really a wanting to go to sleep. Another one was presto in letto. So basically that one was where it's almost time to go to bed, uh, uh, but these were in situations where you wanted to get to uh, sleep even faster. Presto in Italian means fast asleep, so fast to bed. Uh, one of the other one was snebianti. And snebianti was something that when you drank it, it uh, unclouded your thoughts so that you can start thinking more about all the bad things that traditionalism and history and, and the past culture does. And you can clear your mind so that you can start doing uh, new things. And then there was, there was even a category called inventine. Inventine was what you drank when you needed to react to all those thoughts of how terrible the past was so that you can create something. Inventina means to invent, right? So that you can invent something that will make our lives better in the future. Totally nuts, totally beautiful. This is all real. Uh, by the way, uh, the most of the information that I got from this video, uh, for this video, I should say, came from a cocktail book called La Miscelazione Futurista. It's from a friend of mine in Italy called Fulvio Piccinini. Uh, I will leave the link below to his book. Uh, it is actually written in Italian and translated in English as well. 
The publisher is Koki. Uh, now Koki is also a fortified wine a family that was heavily utilized during futurism by the futurist uh, drink, uh, drink makers um, of the time. Let's, uh, let's go into a few more things that futurism changed. Home bars. Before the advent of futurism, Italy did not have home bars. Yes, people probably had a local bottle of wine in their refrigerator or maybe um, a, a bottle of the liqueur down the street, an aperitivo in some sort of a cabinet in the kitchen, but there was no such thing as a home bar with, that was dedicated to the preparation of cocktails. Since the futurists were rejected, people threw vegetables at them. What they were trying to change did not really go very well for the vast, vast, vast majority of Italians. They also couldn't find really places where they can go to drink. And therefore, a lot of the drinking was done at home. And in order to do that at home, they needed to, of course, uh, set up a bar. I am sure you want to hear me talk about the cocktails that the futurists came up with, but before I do, I want to talk to you about a bar. And this bar here is called the Ball Tick Tock. In Rome, there is a building that is owned by a bank company, and they were doing some renovation, and as they pulled out some of the old plaster from the wall, they found uh, some old artwork uh, painted on the plasters and or on the wall. Now that doesn't happen in Rome ever. Uh, but they decided to really peel off carefully what was the artwork below it, and they found a logo of nine dancing letters uh, with the letters B-A-L-T-I-K-T-A-K. -A -A and it was basically a ballroom or some sort of a club for futurists called the Ball Tick Tock. Every single letter on the logo has legs and is dancing. It's a super cool example of futurism art with the movement going on. A letter B that's moving with legs on it and is dancing. Super, super cool. Uh, you should definitely check it out and see the logo and see how beautiful it is. How has that affected the drinking world today? That ball tick tock is now open. It opened a few years ago and there you can enjoy uh, futurist cocktails. Now is the moment that you've all been waiting for. Let's talk about three cocktails that were inside of Fulvio's book. By the way, Fulvio's book has about 18 classic recipes of polybibite. Today, this movement is becoming more and more prominent. And so now we have a movement of neo polybibite, which are new neo classics inspired by the drinks that used to be. But let's talk about the first drink. It's called Avambera. Avambera in Italian means on the fly, nonchalantly. And it's not only a really good name for a drink, but it's also a perfect name to exemplify what futurists were all about. Because doing things on the fly was exactly how they wanted to do it. They rejected every form of conformity and consistency and standardized anything, let alone cocktail recipes. What was in the Ambambera cocktail? Three ingredients and a whole lot of other stuff. Uh, the first ingredient was an Italian brandy, Arzente. The second ingredient was Campari, a product that they always used during uh, futurism. And yet another product that they also used during futurism, which is Strega Liquore. Now, before I get too far away from everything, I wanted to say this. This drink to me looks a hell of a lot like the template of a Negroni, uh, which is gin, Campari, sweet vermouth. In this case, it's brandy, which replaces the gin, Campari, which stays in both drinks, and a smaller portion of Strega, which replaces a full portion of the sweet vermouth. Strega is iron alcohol, it's a liqueur. Um, Vermouth is obviously a fortified wine. There's just some sort of interesting connection between these two templates. I fail to believe that the futurists put this drink in a rocks glass like you would in a Negroni because everything was meant to be controversial. Speaking of controversial, how was the Avambera served? 
garnished with a banana, not a big deal. But it was also served on a highly polished metal tray. And on this metal tray, there were six ingredients that you enjoyed with the drink. What were the six ingredients? The first three were ingredients that came from Italian colonies. Ethiopian coffee, uh, almonds, and bananas. The bottom three were all Italian ingredients. Tomatoes, Parmesan cheese, and anchovies. So the drinker was supposed to take a sip, get these flavors of Campari, that minty uh, junipery flavor from the strega and the uh, sweet oaky notes from the brandy. And as they were sipping on that, eating these different foods from different quote unquote flavor profiles, almonds, kind of neutral, a little bit nutty, cheese, more briny and fresh, take another sip, coffee bean, uh, or coffee ground. I don't know how they served it at that time. Uh, very, very bitter and and uh, and tart. Uh, moving on, take another sip. Piece of uh, a tomato, highly acidic. So it was meant to be a whole extravaganza. Now let's talk about another drink. It was called La Jostra del Alcohol, basically meaning the roller coaster of alcohol. This drink here had Campari, it had a red wine, which was preferably supposed to be a Barbera, it had a honey syrup in it, and then it had Cedrata. Cedrata is an Italian citrus sparkling soda of sort. And uh, this drink here, while the combination of the honey, the wine, the Cedrata, which is citrusy, and the Campari, I feel like if the Campari was only put in as a whisper, its bitter orange notes in this drink uh, could actually, actually could work. Um, nothing really crazy about this drink other than it was garnished with a hunk of cheese and a hunk of chocolate. So as you sipped it, you went again through the yin and yang flavors of uh, fresh, tart, creamy, briny flavors of a cheese paired with or followed by big rich flavors of chocolate going back and forth as you, as you sipped on this drink. Uh, quite a fascinating one. The third drink that I want to talk to you about is called Le Grandi Acque, The Great Waters by Enrico Prampolini, obviously a futurist. In this cocktail here, he basically adds four ingredients. A unaged grappa, Italian of course, a gin, a uh, little bit of kummel, and who knows, a portion or two or three of Sambuca. Now, this here was uh, the drink, these four ingredients. But what you had to do in order to show your rejection for the church was find the host or whatever, the body of Christ, the, 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 the holy bread, whatever is given at church. You had to find one of those, dunk it either in the drink or in the water so that you could make it soft. In it, you would put an anchovy, you would fold it like a taco and close it like it were an agnolini pasta and you would dunk it in the drink. All of this just, of course, for the rejection of the Catholic Church uh, or any church of that time. How did Italian futurism affect the cocktail? I don't know if it affected it. I'm sure some things it did, but I do know that it uh, definitely was at the forefront of some things. When you think about Instagrammability today, right? What is Instagram supposed to do? People take pictures of the cocktails and they're beautiful, oftentimes way more beautiful than they need to be for what you're drinking or for just having a drink. But you put them on Instagram so that you stimulate somebody's uh, senses and you put a smile on their face and they get thirsty and maybe they even want a drink. Italian Futurism was doing this over a hundred years ago. Uh, what else is there? The, in Italian bartending especially, 
there is still a large variety or a large vast amount of bartenders that do not measure ingredients. There is no jigger. It's a free pour way to do it. Um, that is not standardized, but it is standardized and I'll explain how. In those cases, it's not that every cocktail is supposed to come out randomly different. It's that every cocktail is supposed to come out different to the guests liking. So rather than defending the menu of the bar, which is a very common thing to do in other countries, this is how we make our margarita. And it's the only way we make our margarita, right? Uh, that's how it's on our menu. In Italian bartending, it's more no jigger. And if you like your Negroni a little more this way or your spritz a little bit more that way, we're not measuring. We're just going to add an extra splash. I think that component to it might have uh, affected the, the bar world today in Italy and perhaps in other countries. We talked earlier about the home bar. Of course, having a home bar not only educated, uh, not only was something that didn't exist, but it educated people at home because now they learned a little bit more what were the moving parts in making a cocktail. And of course, a consumer that is smarter uh, elevates the whole experience because uh, now the bartenders adapt to uh, the level of the people that they are serving, which overall elevates the bar world itself. That brings us to the end of this video. Uh, I really hope I didn't miss anything, but if you have any comments below, please do drop them and I will try to get to them as soon as I can and get you answers if I have them. And with that, my name is Livio and thanks for watching. I'll see you.